to you all. And also to you. Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. We're glad that you're here on this beautiful day. I was expecting hot weather, but it's okay, you know. Everybody remain calm. Uh, you can sing, but don't move around too much. It might warm us up too much. <laughs> Today is uh, just for a, a good occasion in, in the summertime, Amazing Grace Sunday, and that's kind of like the theme of our, our service today. It will figure in uh, the sermon, the hymn of the day, the, uh, the prayers uh, for the Eucharist and so forth. I think you'll, you'll get the theme before we're done. And if you haven't, uh, following our refreshment time downstairs, we will be showing the film Amazing Grace, uh, which is a 2006 uh, film that tells the story of the uh, efforts to overturn the uh, uh, British slave trade in the late 18th century and the writing of the hymn Amazing Grace. I think you'll enjoy it. It is, however, well, it's a good thing to do for a hot summer afternoon. It's a two-hour film, so if, if you're up for that, if you've not booked for something else, what else is there to do besides the shopping centers, right? So stick around, enjoy us, and it's air conditioned too. Yes, it's air conditioned. Air conditioned, that's all, all the better. So please uh, plan to stay with us for that. Uh, this Tuesday, our food pantry. Wednesday, uh, we of course continue with our Bible study, uh, studying the story, the amazing story of Joseph in, uh, in the book of Genesis. You can join us for that. And Thursday, continuing uh, our Smart Continuum program, which is a, a cooperative venture between this congregation's uh, prison and parole ministry and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. So if you have been or you know someone who has been uh, incarcerated, has rap sheet, whatever, please come. It is a support group and a place to find assistance with uh, the things that you need to deal with in life. In our prayers, uh, just uh, to update us on that, Gerald Rockwell had uh, heart bypass surgery. Well, they didn't bypass his heart, they bypassed the arteries. I have to look at a nurse to get this right. Uh, they bypassed three arteries uh, for him on Monday. He is doing much better. He's getting blood his body needs and recovering rapidly. Please keep Gerald in your prayers. He's at the VA in, in Westwood. Uh, Father Hans is still in Silmar in a convalescent facility. He sends his love to everybody and, and keeps asking me, pray me out of here. <laughs> so please keep him in your prayers to, to get him out of there and back to his home. Mary Holman down in Westminster, doing well, sends her love. Sabrina Murphy, uh, Marie's grandniece, had a very difficult pregnancy in C-section. Please lift her up in your prayers as well. Yes, the twins are doing fine. They weigh like... They would have been 30 weeks on Sunday gestation. They're only at 29 and a half weeks. The boy weighed 8 to 3, 11 to 3, 14, and the girl weighed like 3, 9. Um, they're both doing fairly well. The girl has had a small lead in her brain, but very small. So, so far, they're doing great. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. We're glad about that. Uh, Mary Lou Sabbath, who is a friend of Carla and Bill's, has been diagnosed with cancer. Please. Raise her up in your prayers. And Donovan, we pray for Donovan before. Uh, Donovan Mejia had a brain tumor. He's four years old. We continue to, to lift him in our prayers as well as he uh, recovers from this disastrous event in his young life. Uh, and I believe we still have one candle lighted for Lori Rosted's uncle, uh, Eric Torvala, who passed away about a month ago, I guess, in, uh, in Finland. So please lift him up as well. Let us then turn to the readings of the scriptures for this morning. Good morning. First reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapters 58, verses 9 to 14. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. 
you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Psalms for today. Here. Please read with me the bold text responsible. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless, bless the Lord. who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your mouth is renewed like an eagle. O Lord, you provide vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. You made known your ways to Moses and your works to the children of Israel. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The second reading for the day is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom, and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it should be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised, Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer God, to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed, our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done, 
Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace to you. And may the Lord do wonderful things in your life. Amazing grace. It's, It's hard to do justice to a song that's so familiar. It's hard to say anything new about a song that was first published in the 18th century. And as I look back at the the, the back story of this song, I was shocked that even though uh, it has been published in over 1,000 Christian hymnals, the Lutherans sort of avoided this song until about 35 years ago. Why, I wonder. Well, then I noticed that the hymn never actually mentions Jesus by name. In fact, the hymn seems to be almost all about me you know, about us as as people and not about God. Well, okay, so it might be very pious and and it seemed like we should mention Jesus in every Christian song, but whether we're pious or not, many of us are stuck in ourselves because, well, because of what? Our needs, our pain, our our life experiences are are so overwhelming. We always start with ourselves, don't we? It's, It's human. Even the recovering addict or or alcoholic has to start where she is or where he is. It's only by grace that we can step back from the the looming issues of of our lives and and set down the burdens we're carrying to try to see things differently. The man behind this hymn lived a life which seemed colorful, but it almost destroyed him. John Newton's life was really... a, a a life in two acts. Each one of them was unbelievable were it not for the grace of God. He was born in 1725 in London to a a God-fearing mother and a father who was a shipmaster, a seafarer. And although his mother tried to teach him the Bible, she died when he was not quite seven years old. And he was sent off to a boarding school. At 11 years of age, his father took him to sea. And at 17, he was forced into the British Navy. He did reasonably well in the Navy, He became a midshipman and so forth, but on one occasion he apparently overstayed his shore leave, which is a big no-no. The British Navy has no sense of humor. And he was degraded as a deserter. He was flogged 96 times. One biographer said of him that his life at sea seemed like uh, it was filled with wonderful escapes, with vivid dreams and sailor recklessness. He grew into an abandoned and godless sailor. The religious fits of his boyhood changed into settled infidelity, which means he didn't see God very closely and God didn't see him much. And at one point, he even contemplated murder and suicide just to escape his own life. John Newton was lost. So he took a ship to, uh, uh, on, a, on a trek that was making a down to the coast of Africa where he met a slave trader who gave him a job and then treated him badly and half starved him there. Writing about this later, Newton said that this experience was the lowest moral point of his life. 22 years of age, he escaped the slave trader and again caught a ship called the Greyhound headed back to London. Isn't that kind of ironic to catch a ship named Greyhound? Oh well. Inside story, I guess. With nothing else to do, he's on this ship for a long passage, and he comes across a book on board by Thomas A. Kempis called The Imitation of Christ, which he begins to read. And he reads, and the seeds are planted that would change his life, as if an impressionable mind tossed around at sea is finally beginning to think about what he has done in the first years of his life. And then a shipwreck in the middle of all that. In this huge storm, the entire side of the ship Greyhound was gashed in and it began to sink. And Newton and many others thought this was it, they were going to die. Miraculously, the 
ship stayed afloat because of its cargo, which was beeswax and cam wood, which is a very lightweight wood. Rescued, his un unfortunate life, though, went south again. He, he himself became a slave trader for six years until it became so untasteful uh, to him that he just couldn't do it anymore. He married a childhood sweetheart then and suffered a stroke. You get the picture here? This like one thing after another. Managed to uh, recover from that, took a job as a port tax collector, and he began to study. Somehow in this, God had moved him and found him. Ten hard years passed, and John Newton finally became a priest of the Church of England, assigned to a very poor parish in Olney, where he worked mostly with very poor people and very ignorant people. As he wrote letter, later, though, this parish experience was the high point of his entire life. Gradually, he met very influential people, among them William Wilberforce, who was a member of parliament and who came to oppose slavery. And with William Cowper, John Newton published a hymnal in 1779 where first appears his autobiography, if you will, his autobiography in song, Amazing Grace. He went on to write many other hymns. Over 60 of them are still being used uh, commonly in, in the churches today. Newton's influence, even in his own lifetime, cast a very wide shadow for the gospel. In his late 60s, he was honored with a Doctor of Divinity degree by what became Princeton University. And maybe none of his writings or his hymns are more ironic than his own self-understanding in, in these simple words from the hymn. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. For in his late 70s, he indeed started to go blind, and even though he did not quit preaching, he was totally blind before he died at the age of 82. Look with me, it's in your bulletin right after sermon, look with me at verse 2. I think it's perhaps the centerpiece of this. Maybe we understand that grace relieves fear. We understand that all of our darkness and our burdens and our failures or emptiness can be lifted from us, not because, you know, that we deserve amnesty or because we've earned brownie points or we've got stars in, in our crown or something like that because we're born to privilege. It is as if a gift that God's forgiveness and compassion supplant everything else about our lives, especially our failures. I've said before that I actually prefer to avoid the word sin because that's such a tiresome, tiresome insult to, to hurl at somebody. There's so many ways to talk about what's wrong inside or, or what's wrong with the world around us without using the S word. It's too bad that, at least in my opinion, that the modern wording of the Lord's Prayer uses this phrase, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We, we used to say, forgive us our trespasses, which reminds us that often we step over the line, don't we? Other Protestants say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as if you could buy forgiveness you know, with, with cash or put it on a credit card maybe. But when Jesus tells his, his parable about the good shepherd, he says that the sheep is lost, that the sheep had wandered had gone off course. The sheep is not evil. The sheep isn't a sinner. He doesn't use the sin word. The sheep is lost. And so John Newton said of his early life, I once was lost, but now I'm found. And all his failures, his, his wanderings, his mistakes and dangers, his lost early years, Newton says that grace relieved his fear. But when he speaks of grace, Newton is keenly aware of something, I think, a lot more subtle. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." Before we can receive grace, for many of us, we must first come to terms with our, with our own darkness. We must first understand what honesty to self is all about. People in recovery understand this. They've faced it, step four. Sinners understand this, that before forgiveness, there has to be some repentance, the, the turning around and going in the other direction with your life. 
even sometimes elected officials get this, usually after they've been publicly ridiculed for doing things that they first tried to hide. John Newton understood that we don't come to this realization easily, sometimes never. There are people out there who never face their, their own inner demons or, or, or their, their evils, their past. They put up a front, they lie, especially to themselves, or they respond to things with anger or violence. You probably were also moved as I was this past week in the news uh, by the story of Antoinette Tuff, the brave school bookkeeper in Decatur, Georgia, who through her faith and, and raw courage talked a mentally ill young man out of using his assault weapon and 500 rounds of ammunition on the teachers or the children in the school. It was another Newtown, Connecticut or, or Aurora, Colorado just waiting to happen. And I kind of waited to, to hear another one of those speeches from the NRA that, that only somebody with a gun can stop somebody with a gun. But Antoinette Tuff talked compassionately. She talked understandably, lovingly, with an armed, mentally unstable man, face to face, with a 911 phone call dispatcher on, on the other end of the line. And what this young man said to Antoinette, I think that blew me away. He confessed his darkness to her. He wasn't taking his meds. He, he felt suicidal. He, he thought he had no reason to live. He knew he was going to die. Antoinette called him sweetheart. And she literally talked an AK-47 out of his hands. Afterward, afterwards, uh, Antoinette Tuff kind of deflected any praise. She said, I can't give a credit to myself. That was nobody but God's grace and mercy because I can truly tell you I was terrified inside. And on Friday, she received word that she's being invited to the White House. John Newton had lived this life of darkness, which he hadn't really faced till in the darkness he could stomach it no more. He could not lie about his life to himself. He saw that, that his own awakening, his change of heart, his conversion from being that reckless sailor and the one on the run, a slave ship captain, and invested in the slave trade, incidentally, into a man of peace and compassion, happened not by his own efforts, not, not because he wanted to be a better person, but because of grace. It was a gift that he became terrified of the shape and the shadows of his own life. He was terrified, finally, of God's judgment, terrified that the evils in his life just kept getting bigger and bigger. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And only in that fearful place could he fully grasp, twas grace my fears relieved. Now, it's possible we're thinking, well, my life isn't that bad. I mean, I'm not that desperate. I haven't sold people into slavery. I haven't taken somebody's life. I don't even own an AK-47. I'm a decent person. Like, I don't need God because, well, my life's in control and, and, and it's going well, sort of, except maybe for the, 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 the fast food and the credit cards or something. As if grace, as if God's love or compassion are only important when I get totally desperate or I become a total failure. You heard the story of that woman who's driving around in Hollywood looking desperate for a parking space and she prays to heaven, oh Lord, please, please find me a parking space. I promise I will go to church and everything if you'll just find me a parking space. And then just up ahead, voila, the, a car pulls out and there's a parking space. And so as she screeches in to the parking space, she says, never mind. I don't need grace. It's grace to come face to face with our own desperation. It's also grace to understand ourselves with humility and simplicity as the choir sings today. It's grace to come around where we ought to be instead of thinking of that we're the coolest or that we're the hippest or the powerful or we are the privileged. It is grace to realize that all that we are, all that we have, all that we hope to be in our lives is a gift of God's grace. 
It startles me how often, though, people don't quite get what that means. Grace means gift. It's fundamental to our faith, of course. I mean, it is the first article of faith of the Christian teaching. Not one of the ideas in Christian teaching, but the first idea of Christian teaching. That we are reconciled to God. We are justified in God's eyes. Not because of our good deeds or our hard striving and only and completely because of God's grace as a gift. And we make it our own in faith. So if we don't earn it, we recognize the idea of gift. You don't earn a gift. There's no Christmas time gift exchange with, with God Almighty. We don't, we don't make payments for it either. We don't rack up charges that we have to settle. And when it comes right down to it, we can never clear the slate or, or even the score of debts and credits with God. Have you ever been late on a payment or maybe your rent or your house payment? Have you ever opened the mail and saw staring at you from the envelope three-day notice to pay rent or quit, meaning to get out of the premises? Well, it's not very often that you get into a financial situation like that without some warning. It's usually that you have a grace period before the devil uh, has his due. Life itself, my friends, is grace. It's God's grace period for us. And the grace that we have that teaches our hearts to fear God reminds us in the world out there that, that where there's too much greed and there's too much competition or anger, that we who live by grace, we may be the only sign of God's grace for other people. If you live by grace, if you become God's grace to others, the world will change. Forgive others as, as you have been forgiven. Cut them some slack. Don't look for faults or foibles or conspiracies in the world. Seek the places where through God you may be a sign of grace. Amen. Amen.
I believe in God. Rejoice with all creation around God's throne. The light of the risen Christ puts to flight all evil deeds, washes away sin, restores innocence to the fallen, casts out hate, and humbles earthly pride. Jesus Christ loves you and frees you from your sins by his blood. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We live in the reconciliation of Christ and have peace with God. May peace be with you all. And also may you be. Share the peace with one another.
Please rise for the prayers. Confident in God's compassionate rule and enduring love, let us lift up the needs of the church, the world, and all of creation. Deliver your church, O God, from all that binds and limits. Free us to boldly claim your grace and proclaim the gospel to all who seek you. God, in your mercy. Bestow on your creation ample rain, refreshing winds, and an abundant harvest. Cultivate us in us a deep humility and fresh respect for the environment. Free us to be stewards of life in our land. God, in your mercy. Uphold the oppressed, liberate those in bondage, and strengthen those who struggle under the yoke of repressive government or violent power structures. Especially we pray for the people of Egypt and Syria in their hour of turmoil and suffering. Free us to work for justice and peace. God, in your mercy. Protect and direct this nation and watch over those who serve our nation in uniform, especially our loved ones, Alan, Tasha and Steve, Chaplain David, Troy and Todd, Yobani and John. Free us to strive for a peaceable world and justice for new generations. God, in your mercy. Rescue all who are in harm's way. Sustain the poor and hungry with your grace. Heal those who are afflicted, burdened, incarcerated, or lost. Free us to be your hands of love and compassion. God, in your mercy. Heal those who cry out to you and let your healing spirit uphold those who are weak or ill or struggling to recover good health. Especially we pray for Gerald recovering from surgery for his heart, Sabrina suffering in pregnancy and childbirth, Mary, Joyce, Ellie, and Mercy for strength and capacity, Karen and Kevin for wholeness and strength, Daniel and Carolyn awaiting treatment or surgery. Father Hans for peace of mind and a secure home. Raul Sr. and Bert, Diane, Patty, Carol, Mary Lou, Dolores, Rena, Ray and William who are fighting cancer. Donovan recovering from brain surgery. And for Diana, Bobby, Mario, Edward, Bob and Brenda Ruth Ann, Patty, and Scott for health and well-being. God, in your mercy. Save us from lives and schedules filled with too much activity. Free us to be a Sabbath people who take time for rest and renewal, worship and reflection. 
God, in your mercy. Now you may add your petitions. We pray for those whose homes are threatened by the rim fire and for those who are fighting this fire, that their lives may be preserved. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Your mercy is great. God, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, please never, ever let the word never mind come from my mouth to your ears. I humbly ask for you for forgiveness for all my sins and for all my brothers and sisters who have sinned, of which I am sure you are aware. Hear our prayer. Gather us at the last with all your saints and bring us in awe and joy to your unshakable kingdom, the heavenly Jerusalem. Free us from all that is passing in order to embrace what is eternal. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, in mercy, hear the cries of your people and answer us according to your steadfast love. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We may be seated, our ties and offerings will not be received. Thank you. 
How precious is your grace, O God, from the first hour we have you. How precious are your promises through every trial and fear. So with saints and angels above, we praise your name and join their unending gift.
Let us pray. O oh God, our Creator and Redeemer, send us your children with the power of your Holy Spirit to proclaim your grace and to announce that the peace of your reign is near to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. In your Lord's body and his precious blood, which you have received, strengthen you with all faith and grant you grace for life. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. 